This is the Dane Moore MBA podcast brought to you by the Genesis Company coming at Monday morning. It's November 13th. And from our respective hotel rooms here in San Francisco, I've got Wolves beat writer Chris Hine here with me to discuss the Wolves' sixth straight win, a 116-110 win over the Warriors on Sunday night. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Dane. It is a uh, 10 a.m. out here. Uh, Hopefully the, the listeners up for like four the, hours. Now, hopefully the like, listeners and the viewers are a little forgiving of us uh, yes. and getting this out a little later than anticipated. Deal um, with it. <laughs> deal with, deal, we're dealing with lighting issues in the hotels now, oh, yeah. now that we're now that we're big YouTube stars. Yes, we got to make sure the lighting is right. I don't need the sun. Like if I were to open this, yeah, you look I like mean, it. it's just like <laughs> it, it's like it's like a heavenly beam is perched outside my window. Um, and, and what did I say to you? I said, I don't care what it looks like as long as our <laughs> hotel internet hold here for, for right. a YouTube stream. That'll be a, that'll be a win. Yeah, um, that works. I, I think as I was sitting down trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to talk about, Carl is kind of the main thing that that came to my mind, not just off of that Warriors game last night, but it felt like um, he really turned a corner in that the second half of the San Antonio game right on Friday. And then mm -hmm. that carried over uh, in, into golden state here. I want to, we haven't on the pod really dug into Carl's defense or talked about that that much. So I want to get into that, but first just offensively, because I do think like the offense kind of stimulates when Carl's getting buckets kind of stimulates his defensive stability a little bit too, kind of keeps him calm. Yeah. Um, and so just offensively, what have you seen from from Carl or Carl in the context of the offense lately? I think it's been really important for him to get, to get the dribble drive game going. Yeah. And I think that's the number one thing that we've seen from him. Um, he had the offensive foul issues in a, in a couple of the, the games with the with the hooks and everything. He didn't really I don't think he got called for any of them last night yeah. um, or the call or the calls went his way. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's been the number one thing that I've noticed is he gets that going and it seems like that really helps unlock everything else in the offense. Right. Um, you know, it makes, it gives him maybe a little more room to shoot threes because guys have to respect the, the dribble drive. Um, and like you said, defensively, I think he's looked, he's looked really good, um, at times this early this season, last night, especially, um, and, you know, we think back to that Denver game when he was guarding Jokic yeah. for, for most of the night as well. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. where that corner kind of turned, right? Where we were yeah. like, wait, is Carl playing awesome defense? <laughs> Carl's playing good defense. Like, and you know, they don't, I think what's important about the way the wolves are structured now is that they don't need him to play great defense necessarily. Yeah. Like that burden is on others on the team. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you, you need to like hide Carl quote unquote, no, uh, we've seen him play well when he's been asked to play on the perimeter before. You think back to, to two seasons ago when they were playing the high wall scramble and he was pretty good at that. I wrote like, that down, too, man. Yeah. I was like that. I think that which is kind of a obviously but two years ago before Rudy's here, mm -hmm. you're not making like a plan of how Carl's going to someday play next to uh, elite rim protecting center. But mm -hmm what that defense asked Carl to do was for the first time in his career, get out on the perimeter, the high wall up to touch, whatever you want to call it. And, and scramble a little bit, move his feet left and right. And now that happens to more so be his general duty defensively when, yeah. when he's in coverage, like I don't think that this team is playing as good of defense, defensive rating, whatever, whatever, uh, as, as they are right now, if Carl didn't, the year before Brody got here, start getting comfortable playing on the perimeter because now he's just often asked it. Not exclusively. I mean, in a lot of right. these games, he's guarding fives too. Like, right. and it is the more he's guarding Looney, like Looney last night. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. When when he when he is asked to guard these these more perimeter oriented fours, mm -hmm. you know, he's been up to the challenge, or that he's been able to really contribute in that way. And that's really been the key, I think, across the board for right. for whether it's Carl, Rudy, or Nas, their ability to guard on the perimeter has been so important to the success of, of this yeah. defense, um, it, it, whichever situation that they're in. Um, and I think that's one of the main, maybe underrated reasons why this defense has looked so good is because these guys are able to, 
have been able to get out to the perimeter and guard. Right. It, it was interesting. So just like after the game, I, I knew I wanted to talk about Carl. I knew I, that it, defensively that was like uh, that had been on my mind. And so I kind of went through just everybody we talked to last night. Like, what are you what are what is cat bringing defensively most? And it, it was funny to like fin everyone had a like kind of different answer. Like Finch said awareness. Jaden said more comfort in those different coverages like we were mm -hmm. just talking about. Uh, Mike Conley said communication. And then Rudy Gobert said defensive rebounding is kind of like all perfectly <laughs> fitting for yeah, what those yeah. guys he's, he's adding are. A little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're all uh they're all true. All, all those things uh, are happening. I do think the one that has been there pretty much all nine games has been the defensive rebounding, even when Carl was uh was kind of struggling offensively at the beginning of the season. That like that Boston game only has seven points, but Watching that fourth quarter, I'm like, hey, at least Carl's cleaning the glass here. You know, like yeah. Tatum misses a shot. He's getting it there. So I do think the defensive rebound, one, we know that's important. But two, I think Carl, that is like baseline, something he can contribute and has contributed uh, every game. Here's Rudy um, on Carl's defense. Where are you feeling Carl's impact defensively most? I think he's um... – just his presence, you know, just just not shying away from, you know, protecting the rim, being, being there, you know, he's, he's a very smart player, uh, and uh, when he's just going and not thinking, you know, he's, uh, he's about to have, a, I think, a lot of impact, you know, on that end, and and, uh, and also his defensive rebounding, I think he's, he's huge, when he doesn't hit me, you know, but uh, I like that, I like that, he doesn't hit me. <laughs> But uh, opens up like you to be able to kind of work, yeah. right? If you can guard. I mean, it's amazing that you know I know that I can be, I can contest a shot, and I know that there's, you know, Cat, Naz, or even Kyle, you know, down there, that is able to, to get that rebound, and I think it's uh, it's very important, you know, when you want uh, when you talk about being a great defensive team. Um, People tend to forget that rebound is the key to close a, a defense, a defensive stop, and uh, and this is very important, you know. And last year I thought we we weren't there mentally. This year I think we really took a step, and um, and I think we still have a long way to go to where we can be. So Chris, obviously, two years ago they're the worst defensive rebounding team in the NBA. Uh, that's the year before Rudy. Last year, even with Rudy, their fifth worst in defensive rebounding. They're uh, up to middle of the pack uh, thus far this season. Obviously, the first that, that went down a little bit last night. They did give up uh, a lot of offensive rebounds, but that did shift in the second half some. And I was just going through some, some clips. This isn't even super yeah. cat specific, but when one of the bigs, whoever it is, like contests a shot, the functionally the center in, in that given play, what I'm knowing is like, noticing is the pursuit of the other big to the offensive glass. Like how many times I, I, have you seen like just Rudy kind of like fly in and snatch one, you know, or right. Carl or Nas. And, and I think it's that it's, it's the comfort in the contesting big to know that the other guy is coming. That's what's making this team really good defensively because they're contesting so many shots. I mean, the opponents are shooting terribly against the Wolves thus far this season. And it's because I think they're selling out on the shot contests with a greater comfort that someone off in the other big is coming in uh, to to clean the glass around them. It's a weird game to like be complimenting their defensive <laughs> rebounding because that right. was probably their, right. their, their worst of the season. But, but broadly, Rudy has been great defensively contesting shots. Mm -hmm. And for him to be able to do that, Carl, Nas, Kyle or Ant need to be in like hot pursuit of the defensive glass to end the possession. Cause like what you said, like th that's a pretty big part of defense is actually ending the, the possession. I think what's been, what's been interesting to watch is I, I noticed the same thing you did as well, where it's like, okay, I, there seems to be a real recognition of Rudy's out 15 feet from the perimeter or 15 feet from the basket contesting. I Carl, I need to get back. I need to go back and get the rebound. Um, I think what's been interesting about the rebounding issues is there's been a trend in the last couple of games where it's been like they start out not so rebounding bad. well. So right? This bad. happened that's in the San Antonio game too. Yes. Yeah. And I think it, I think it happened uh, 
even in the New Orleans game, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. But like, and Finch has noticed this too. We we talked about it briefly at practice on on uh, Saturday. He's like he's like first of all, for some of us, we start out rebounding poorly, and then like they seem to get better as the game goes on. Like I, I, I mean, they got they, better in the second half last yeah. night. It wasn't perfect, but it was better than the, yeah. like, the first quarter, for instance. Um, but I they, think they, it's they, like they, probably six games the opposing team has offensive rebounded like their first shot. That they yeah. Missed. Like yeah. It, it, yeah. almost every first miss feels like an offensive. Was, rebound. Yeah. I'm thinking back like the first possession of the season, like uh, yeah. Toronto, <laughs> Toronto got a, got a rebound. Um, it, feels, it does feel like that. So yeah. I don't, I don't know what that is about early in the games, mm -hmm. you know, that, that they don't seem to be on it as much as they are, you know, in the second yeah. half, for instance, um, I don't know, but but it just it goes it just goes to show you about like the state of this defense right now where we're kind of like nitpicking this. <laughs> right. It's like yeah, we're, we're nitpicking like why can't they get offensive rebounds in the first quarter or defensive right. rebounds yeah. in the first quarter of games? <laughs> totally. It's like that that just kind of tells you like overall where this defense is compared to where it was last year, two years ago, whatever. That like this is what we're we're drilling down on to like have them try to perfect. Um, because and there's, there's a ton of defensive rebound opportunities. Well, that's the thing. There's so many misses, right? Because yeah. they're guarding they're guarding people so well mm -hmm. in half court defense that guys teams are missing. Another they held the Warriors under forty percent last night. Um, you know, so plenty of misses, plenty of opportunities. Um, and yeah, like once they started rebounding in the second half of the game, they went up double digits. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's the, I, I remember I, I was just sitting there last night thinking like they. They are a better team than Golden State. Like, Clearly. just just look at. I mean, listen. Yeah. You know, Steph can come out and score 40, 50, and you know, you'll still lose. But like, I'm just looking at how they matched up with Golden State last night, and then the bench units. I'm like, they're a better team as long as they just get out of their own way a little yeah. bit here. They're gonna win this game, and that's eventually what happens. I mean, I, I just felt like Golden State played like a little desperate physically against yeah. the size. And and the, like some of that kind of work like that, that it took away like they were just hitting Rudy all the time, which I think took away some of the lobs to to Rudy that those weren't really there. It's more so like the catches and then he gets clobbered and now he's at the mm -hmm. at the free throw line. But I just kind of noted that in my head, too. Like, I think that might be the reaction from teams who are either severely undersized in comparison to the wolves or kind of, I think what you're saying is are at a overall talent discrepancy here of like, well, if we just play them straight up, they're kind of bigger and maybe even faster or more athletic than us in some ways. Like we're, I don't know. I, I just felt like Draymond, Saric, Looney, whatever. We're like, we are, Rudy is going to have to go through a war in this game. If he wants right. to, if he wants to come through and, and, and that to, I was like, okay, Rudy didn't lose his head when that was yeah, happening. Yeah. And, and I thought about that. I was like, that's typically the thing that can dysregulate Carl, right? A team just being overly physical with him and then not. Um, and if he doesn't get a call or two, he really stayed calm, cool, collected uh, through that, through that whole game. And again, a game where the, the opponent was playing really physical. It's always interesting. I'm like, what? so why? So why, like, what allowed Carl to stay there the whole time? Because he was the best player in that game. I mean, you look at Ant had like 33, 6, and mm -hmm. 7. We're, we're going to talk about him after the break. But, like, Carl at 21 and 14, I mean, he's had way bigger numbers than that in a bunch of other games that, you know, we've seen. But I thought he was very clearly thought, the most impactful very player. Very good game. It must have been because his fantasy team was doing well yesterday. We had a brief chat about that in the <laughs> – the locker room before the game. I mean, listen, when, when my fantasy football team does well, I'm in a very good mood, generally speaking. When my <laughs> fantasy, as you know, when my yeah. fantasy teams do bad, sometimes I'm inconsolable. So he was having a good day fantasy football wise yesterday. Yeah. Maybe that maybe that contributed to his to his mood a little bit. You um, think you write better stories after the Niners? <laughs> I'm more focused, I'll say that. Like, you know, I'm I'm not thinking about, you know, the Super Bowl is, is going down the drain and things like that. Um so, but, you know, li listen, it's, it's a long season. We know Cat is prone to, to those kind of, those kind of games. But give credit uh, when it doesn't happen. Give credit right? when like, it doesn't happen. We give yeah. credit when, when he has games where he puts it all together. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, he had, 
what was it, 10 fewer shot attempts than Ant overall, but yeah. was more efficient, you know, with sure. his with his scoring. He's been willing. I think it should it shouldn't go unnoticed that he has been willing to kind of seed some of these bigger moments or, or late game moments to Ant, you know, mm-hmm. and do a little sacrificing on behalf of maybe the the betterment of the team. If you know, because how, how many times have we seen Carl be the one to initiate late game offense? It's really been very much Ant heavy yep. this season. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think he should he should get a little credit for that as well. Where it's like he's I think he's sacrificing some things to try and and help this team uh, a, a little bit as well. That's a good point. Let's uh, let's grab a break and then uh, let's get into talking about Ant in particular. Today's show is brought to you by Falling Knife Brewing Company. I heard over the weekend uh, Friday night for the San Antonio game, uh, a bunch of fans were there uh, watching that game. Obviously, these next few the Golden State game on Tuesday and Phoenix on, I think it's Wednesday, back-to-back there, are kind of the later uh, West Coast games. So Falling Knife wants me to let you know that they are going to be staying. Uh, not you, Chris. I think you're going to be at those games. <laughs> yes, the I listeners, will be, yeah. uh, Know that they're going to stay open uh, late for those for the whole game. Uh, Central time, I think the Warriors game's at 9, and the Suns game is, is at 8. So they will uh, stay open for that. They normally close uh, mm-hmm. earlier than that. So, again... Uh, what better time to be watching the Wolves with other Wolves fans than in the middle of a, you know, a six-game winning streak and what feels like a pretty believable one? So, Falling Knife Brewing Company uh, in Northeast Minneapolis. Check it out on uh, Tuesday night for the Warriors or Wednesday night for Phoenix, maybe both. All right, Chris, let's uh, let's get into Ant uh, a little bit here. I I put this. I, I said this to you before we started recording, but I wrote my notes. I was like. Ant is just consistently putting up big numbers when it doesn't even feel like to me that he's playing great. You know, like yeah. I didn't, I didn't feel that, but it, I mean, I knew at the end of the game, he kind of took over. Finch said, Carl got him there. Ant closed it out. I look at him like 33, six and seven. And like, if my just in my brain was grading it, I would have been like, I don't know. That was like a B minus game from Ant. Like it, yeah. it felt like, but he is consistently, consistently, having an impact in these games that are contributing to winning pretty much regardless of if his shot's going in or not. Like yeah, it, when he yeah. is on the floor, it that this team has has completely, you know, the needle is moved to a whole different level when when Ant is playing. What have you seen go into Ant's just significant impact on winning this season compared to previous years well i mean i i think you said it in the stat line it's not so much the 33 it was the six and seven to yeah. me that's that's really significant even so even when he was struggling shooting last uh last night and he got it going towards the end um but he's still he's still grabbing grabbing some rebounds i think i think six is right around the number where they would like him to get you know like maybe mm-hmm. around seven would be would be great um and then, but it's the assists too, like seven assists. Like that's what you want to see. I think his playmaking is taking another step this season. I just anecdotally watching him play, watching him play this year compared to watching him the last three years, I am finding myself watching him and like he's hitting guys that he hasn't like like hit sure. before, like on plays. Like he's finding. He's finding guys in the, in the flow of the offense or in spots on the floor that he wasn't doing before. I'm like, he's surprising me a little bit where it's mm-hmm. like, ooh, like a year ago, he wouldn't have found that guy in the corner or he wouldn't have thought to throw that pass to this guy. And we know, of course, he's trying to make a more uh, and more of an effort to get Rudy involved offensively. Mm-hmm. Um, that's still a work in progress. So there's still multiple times a game I'm seeing Rudy almost like jumping in the lane and Ant doesn't see him. So that, <laughs> but that that's that's still a work in progress. Um, but it, it, it's all these other things. And defensively, um, he was on Wiggins last night, and Wiggins did what would he have like six, seven points, something like that? Like Wiggins having a did, bad year, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's a whole other. But if thing. I mean, to your yeah. point, still like but some still, of it is. Yeah, Ant Ant was was mm-hmm. playing good defense on him. Yeah. you know. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it's all it's all the other things. Um, mm-hmm. and then eventually, after a, a chat with Mike Conley last night, he gets the 
he gets the shot to start falling in the fourth quarter and mm -hmm. they they pull away I, I think that's the difference between a couple years ago and now is he's more consistent with with the effort in the other areas of the game right. um even if the shot's not particularly falling on a given night i looked this up this far stumbled upon this this morning um ant is fourth in the nba in usage rate mm -hmm. which is that's not just shots you know that's assists and turnovers and whatever it's generally like how often do you have the ball right right it's luca Giannis, trey then ant in mm -hmm. in usage rate in the nba and i don't again that's something i felt like i haven't felt watching every game it doesn't i don't know i've watched a a handful of Atlanta games this year, a couple Dallas games, and it feels so so Luca and Trey centric. Obviously, Giannis over the years, we can all we can all picture right. that. Um, watching Wolves games does not feel that way to me. That it's as ant centric as it is those guys. Yeah, and it's just interesting because I've always had the curiosity. I've talked with all you guys about this multiple times. Of like, you know. Does Ant ever go into the Harden or the Luca role or whatever that is, where the, it is they, as James Harden right. would say, they are a system in and of themselves. And Finch has, I think, probably to his credit, has always been really resistant to the idea of, of overfeeding that idea, and as he would say, finding it in the flow. And he's right. finding the same usage in the flow. And I think that's when I say, okay, it was thirty-three, six, and seven, and it didn't feel like that. Or, or, you know, Britt rattled off some net rating numbers on off the floor to me last podcast with uh, with right. what Ant's doing. And it's it, it's hard to point to exactly what it is. I think what it is is the ball is in Ant's hands a ton and good things are happening when the ball is in Ant's hands. The defense is reacting differently. It's the extra guy coming in. So he's got a kick to Jaden or Nikhil that are wide mm -hmm. open. Like it is he is turning into a system in and of himself. But that's not the system, you know, and then that might be the that might be the the perfect balance. So I don't know. Those, those well, usage rate it's, numbers stood out. But I think it's I think to your point, it's like, OK, they want to play a certain style of play, ball movement, share, making the right play. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that is what is going to free him like that. That is what this is. Mm -hmm. this, that's what this is all about is like. If we have ball movement, they, the defense just can't focus on one particular player. So therefore, when we're in the flow of the offense, Ant will have opportunities to mm -hmm. create and, and shoot and play make out of that because the defense will constantly be shifting, moving, and they can't just load up on Ant. Mm -hmm. So that so it kind of works hand in hand in that way where it's like, obviously they want to get him going and he's the focal point of what they do offensively, but they can't always like operate in that mm -hmm. form because that's just not how their offense is, is built to, to move they need it, a point guard sometimes they need a point guard right they need they need mike conley out there to to run the mm -hmm. show and get things organized and get things moving so that's that's the difference it's like it's not like ant is always just taking every possession he's dribbling 30 feet from the basket calling for a screen roll and that's how things get initiated you mm -hmm. know that's that's just not how they how they operate as opposed to like say Dallas, for instance, mm -hmm. or Atlanta, um, or, or Milwaukee. Atlanta. Yeah, right? Exactly. It's not as scripted. It's not as scripted in that way. Um, and yeah, I was just—I literally was just looking up the on-off numbers, uh, you know, that Britt was telling you about. And it's—it's it's, the offensive numbers are pretty stark. Um, oh, dude! <laughs> it's like what? What is it here? Uh, Ninety-two point five offensive rating when he's off the floor. What? Uh, yeah, one hundred and sixteen point oh. six when he's on the floor. So a difference—a difference of almost twenty. <laughs> when he's on the floor versus off it um like like biggest difference on the team obviously um that's 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 crazy so it is so and, and you were asking ant and mike about this last night after the game i i think what is allowing ant to have more usage is that the point guard mike this year versus d last year is just significantly lower usage right yeah and but situationally sometimes as as happened last night in the fourth quarter finch is like all right mike like stop just being a catch and shoot guy spot up you know on on the side there and be yep. you know be the initiator uh of of the offense why don't you why don't you describe 
uh, what what kind of happened there in in the fourth quarter between Ant yeah. and, and Conley. So I I know we saw like maybe with about six minutes left or so, the Wolves had three three straight possessions where it was Ant ISO ball three, and yeah. all three of them missed. Um, and so Conley comes back in the game, and like right away you notice like. Conley takes the ball and he scores on two straight possessions, gets good mm-hmm. shots, and the Wolves get two but two straight buckets. And to me, that that right there kind of sums up mm-hmm. like their late game offense right now, where it's yeah. like they they still tend and Ant still tends to want to go into like ISO ball mode, and I'm going to get to a step back three, which is which we know is not productive for them. And now Mike or Conley only comes, situationally, it's like it's right. a home run or a strike. Once, once in a while, it, it works, right? But most of the time, it's not. That's not going to be the way they should play. So Mike mm-hmm. comes out there, and so I just, I just kind of use it as an opportunity to start asking them, like, this to me is like the difference in your late game execution from a year ago. Is like Mike Conley comes on the floor, and all of a sudden, two buckets happen. They stop a potential run. They're still mm-hmm. up double digits. Um, and so I asked Ant about that. Um, and he basically, he basically said that Mike's told him to stop shooting threes, <laughs> get, get to the basket, get to the foul line. The refs were calling some things for him last night. Mm-hmm. So get to the foul line and just get inside the three point line. And then we saw Ant got to the, and then later on in the quarter, four straight Wolves possessions, two free throws for Ant, a layup and two mid range jumpers that, that connect eight straight points from like the three minute to the two minute mark or whatever it was. And that iced the game as well. So like those two working in tandem, Mike with a little, Mm -hmm. the little advice, some, some vet wisdom Mm -hmm. uh, comes in and has a, and has a big impact on how the wolves execute late in that game, which is probably something that doesn't happen a season ago. I was talking with somebody before the game uh, about, uh, again, I don't, I don't know why this is, Maybe this is just where conversations go when a team is playing really well. You you do do the nitpick thing and you go, what like how attainable are the things uh, that they're not great at yet? Right. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I haven't covered a good team ever. Um, <laughs> but like yeah. and, and, and what someone said to me is they need to learn how to play with a lead. That's probably one of their biggest weaknesses right now because that's new. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's. um obviously something they struggled with last year when it happened. It's, it's the idea that, all right, we're up by 18 kind of downshift and um, you know, the football analogy, run the ball. Right. right. And, and in reality, what I think is probably necessary for this team is to keep probably all teams keep doing what you're doing. And the wolves, when they get slow, they get real slow. Right. Yeah. So it's almost like when they have a 15 point lead in the third quarter or whatever, I think if you're Finch, you almost want to like turn it up because right. there's going to be this natural inclination um, to slow down. And and I was thinking about that conversation as the you know third, fourth quarter rolled around. And it's like, I think it was the going in the fourth, they're up by like 12 or 14. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, it's going to be an interesting test for playing with a lead. And, you know, that's not enough to just, you know, 12, 14 points to just coast through the fourth quarter, particularly against right. the Warriors. And, and I think they did kind of start coasting. But what happened was the Mike Conley, Anthony Edwards sort of mind meld. And that allowed this team to continue to be playing in a way that they had been earlier in the game that got them uh, to get in the lead. I know that sounds like way easier said than done. But I think, you know, we all would. We played basketball. Like, like everyone kind of knows that feeling. Like when you have a lead, it's easy to slow down a little bit and and I, I i thought that was a notable a notable sign of growth for this team uh in in the second half particularly the third fourth quarter for the wolves last night as they looked confident playing with a lead the, the other part of that too is the way that they've played defensively too has been able to kind of stymie runs or you know mm-hmm. like roles that opponents would get on you know last year or two years ago, whatever, like those runs aren't happening as much or they're not as devastating because of how they've been able to defend. Even if the offense is getting bogged down or, or slow moving, the defense has still been there to provide like a, a level kind of foundation in those moments where mm-hmm. it's it's harder for teams 
to come back against them in those situations as well. Yeah. Um, while they figure out how they're going to play offense. I'm, I'm with you. It's like you, you have a team down 15, like they should be shooting and, and every team does this, but like you got to try to get that into 25, 30 before you, you should be downshifting. Right. Um, so that that's, you know, again, it's nitpicking. It's another sign of growth for this team. If they can, if they can start doing that. Um, offensively, I'm with you though. They need to maintain the, the same style of play, the same rhythm. Like, don't just dribble out. Can't 10, stall out. Can't yeah. stall out. Can't just dribble away 10 seconds of the shot clock, mm-hmm. you know, just because you're slowing the game down. Um, keep moving. Keep keep trying to get stuff early in the clock. Like, just, mm-hmm. you know, do what you do. Do do what you do. And then if there's five minutes left and you're up 25, then downshift. Sure. <laughs> 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 then take it a little easy. But, well, yeah. It- it, it was kind of like the story of of last season offensively mm-hmm. was how like I mean pretty much every game of the twenty five or whatever that Carl and Rudy played in there was a stalling period right and yeah. it was kind of like all right they are not finding offense here for this five minute stretch is it going to become an eight minute stretch is it going to become a quarter and a half or is it going to stop here at five and. And again, I would kind of heap in praise on Mike here, but I, I play this clip, but it was really loud in the locker room. I tried to, I cut it before and I'm like, yeah, you, you can't hear it. So I'll kind of just describe it. Um, mm-hmm. The Wolves with Carl and Rudy on the floor last season had an offensive rating of like 107.3. And the worst offensive team in the league last year was Charlotte and they were 109. So literally the cat right. and Rudy, I mean, we know this, but it was, it was worse than the worst team in, in the league. And thus far this season, the Cat and Rudy minutes offensively are at 119, which is just a hair below what Sacramento's <laughs> offense was last year, which was the number one offense in the mm-hmm. league. Mm-hmm. And and again, I think a lot of that has to do with the inclusion of Mike Conley, who is this low usage player on this team. But but he's, he was asked about that, and he said, it's about the spacing with the two bigs. I try my best to make sure... I put them in the right spot so that Cat has room to play, that Rudy has room to roll. For my job, I have to sacrifice a lot. I can't go out there and shoot every time in a pick and roll. I got to get Rudy a ball. I got to get Cat a ball, Ant a ball. I'm just trying to keep the flow going. Those guys seem to be going well and happy, so I'm doing a pretty good job, I think. <laughs> and like, which yeah. funny, funny at the end there, but it really is almost a role and a job that needs to be taken on by like a 36 year old who. Like, is that the point in their career where they don't care about the stats? Yeah. Because it's going, if things are going like well, Mike's like a seven points per game guy, you know, like right. it's it, it sometimes, <laughs> and, and there's, there's situations where they need Mike to make some shots and create a little bit when, when the offense does stall out. But broadly, I mean, he's the, the game manager quarterback and that he's willingly taken on that role, I think is um, it just, extremely meaningful for this team even if it might not you know come out in the the counting numbers it just it just kind of goes to show you like he is the right fit for totally. what this team needed mm-hmm. and you know just getting that that trade last season was was so huge i think for what this team is becoming now mm-hmm. um and you know i i feel i feel like the, the the quote about him like i can't always shoot in the pick and roll i feel like you you notice that in games like he comes off of, of a screen and roll and he might have a decent look at a three or he might have a decent look at a 15 footer mm-hmm. um but he's he's trying to consciously get everybody else going because right. getting a, getting ant going getting carl going raises the ceiling on a given night if you get those guys in a rhythm mm-hmm. um offensively um, and he and he has shown like on nights where they need him to shoot or put up you know six threes or whatever that he he still hits him, he still makes defenses respect him, and you know credit to him last night he was chasing Clay Thompson all around the floor and, yep. and held Clay to five of sixteen, survived a chop block from Chris Paul, um, yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> I didn't even see that live. I mean, did you I, like I, I, saw, I, that, I like... saw the replay and it yeah. looked, it looked bad. Like it looked, it looked looked really bad. It looked like mm-hmm. Chris Paul went out of his way to dive into the legs of Mike Conley, and not great. 
No. Um, so he survived that after initially looking like he might have hurt his knee. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like he's he's been able to defend well still. The only off game he had was the game he had food poisoning in Atlanta. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and but other than that, like I remember in the Boston game, he did kind of the same thing offensively in the second half of that game where mm -hmm. stalling out, he comes yep. in. I think it was that third quarter. He hit like two straight buckets or three straight buckets or something like that. Mm -hmm. Got the offense back together and and was a major reason why they won that game against Boston because of what he did in the in the third quarter before Ant went crazy in overtime. Um, if I if I recall that correctly. Yeah. No, I I, I think that's right. It, it's just this idea of like to make the double big thing work, which isn't just. Carl and Rudy, it's the inclusion of Nas or even, you know, I think Kyle Anderson at times too, and he's in at the four. Um, mm -hmm. You do need that spacing and that structure, right? Yeah. In, in, in those times, I think, I think Mike provides that in, in many ways, but just broadly, like, I think the bigs in and of themselves are starting to believe in that double big look so much more. There's such a greater confidence and in, I, I don't know if you feel this way, but it, it doesn't, and maybe it's just because Nas is playing a lot more this season. But when we talk about the double bigs now, or when the players talk about the double bigs now, it's not just Rudy and Carl. It, right. it is a hundred, it's definitely the inclusion of Nas, but but also uh, also Kyle too. I thought this was Rudy got around to an interesting answer on this. He was just asked about the difference of playing with Rudy versus or Rudy was asked about the difference of playing with Nas versus Carl. Um, but he kind of just got into this whole idea of the identity of, of the double bigs and, and the confidence they have. So mm -hmm. here's Rudy on that. I know they have similar games, but what are the differences between playing with Cat and playing with Nas? I mean, they both, like you said, different players, both very unique players. Uh, I think Nas is maybe more, maybe more of a, yeah, more of a score. I mean, Tough to say that because Cat is scoring, but Cat is more of a passer at times, you know, and, and Nas is uh, yeah, he's bringing us that spark of the bench, you know, that that punch. Uh, and uh, he's really good also at punishing mismatches, which is huge for us, you know. Uh, I mean, a couple of games ago, he, uh, he was able to, yeah, to, 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 kill them down, to kill them down low because they were switching and uh, there's nothing they could do guarding Nas. And just being able to have that, you know, uh, those different combos of players, I think. Uh, it's very unique, you know. It's there's not another team I think in the league that has that those, those type of uh, of talent, you know, those type of mix that we can put on the floor with all, all different big lineups, and uh, and even with Kai, you know. Uh, I mean, those, just the four of us, you know. It's uh, and we are learning how to play, play with one another. Uh, yeah, that's good. We are we are learning how to like yeah, play together, and um, and uh, we're getting better every night. Is interesting how we're learning more of the differences between the three and how those like puzzle pieces fit together, right, Chris? Like yeah. the, the just the punishing punishing mismatches thing with Nas, who's obviously if we're doing we're ranking the bigs, he's not better than Rudy and Carl. He's the third best of the the three of them, but he's the best at punishing mismatches, right? Yeah. Like Rudy, that is not a a strength of Rudy's. It can't Carl situationally, but we've seen him be frustrated by smalls all the time. Like, I think that's just a perfect example of like the third best of them is the best at some pretty important things too. Yeah. And that is leading to this, you know, a puzzle that actually creates a picture rather than an idea. Like I felt like that's just what the whole big experiment was last year. It's this idea. And, and quite frankly, it's probably why many of us missed on, the idea of what this team even could be because we're finally seeing these things in practice more frequently and going, Oh yeah, that does kind of make sense. And you're not getting exposed on the other side of the floor, right? The, the, right. the group of the four bigs has made substantially more sense this season when watching uh, than it did a year ago. Yeah. It, it is another weapon for them to deploy because we've seen this team at times struggle with switching defenses yep um it, it's what <clears throat> it's what's given them uh some real trouble at times and so n being able to deploy nas in those situations and like, i'm just thinking like you know you, you can kind of picture it in your mind nas goes up sets a screen they 
guy mm-hmm. switches on to him and all of a sudden Nas is going right for the block mm-hmm. <laughs> and like yeah. he's he's so good at doing that he gets the ball does a little move layup right like that's right. that's a quintessential Nas kind of possession um and it's it's what he does does so well it, it it's almost like a it's a luxury to to have and, and Nas fitting into that picture is I think like you said maybe a little more underrated and underappreciated than maybe we we thought yeah. or especially at this time last year because I think we so. didn't we didn't think Nas was going to be in the picture at this time, <laughs> this time last year it's true um before Carl got hurt um so you know it's almost like they I want to say they accidentally kind of stumbled into this because they were not thinking that this was a three-headed monster no. with Nas when they 12 months ago they weren't they that... were not no absolutely not and so they've kind of found that this was an essential piece to it it's like having Nas and his skill set and having him just kind of come into the 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 DNA and the and the structure of how they want to play offensively and defensively like they don't have to like switch up drastically based on whether they have one big on the floor or two bigs mm-hmm. on the floor because if, if Nas wasn't a part of this you would have Rudy and Cap minutes you know, uh, together, but then you'd have Rudy solo minutes and Carl solo minutes, and maybe you have to play a little differently yeah. based on that. But now you have, you know, because now a maintained a factor, identity or whatever, correct, maintain yeah. identity, whether it's offensively, whether it's defensively, and you don't really have to switch it up all that much. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can kind of play, play similarly in that, in that respect. You know what I think is big in, unlocking that is is finch showing more confidence in nas Mm -hmm. and and i mean a year ago if he would have did what he did at the end of the first quarter and give up the offensive rebound to saric saric makes the layup he takes out of bounds and he passes it to curry and curry gets a layup a really bad like 10 second stretch for nas i'm not sure how much more nas would have played in that half a a season ago but he was back out there to start the second quarter and like uh, I mean, I'm not saying Nas has been playing bad these last few games, but he has gone from like scalding the mm-hmm. first five, six games of the season to these last two or three, like it's been a little up and down, you know. He's not, and he's not, he's not Nas Reed all caps anymore. <laughs> it's like Nas Reed yeah. capital N capital R for the right, last couple yeah. of years. Yeah. Yes, yes. And and that's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. gonna we talked about that with like Rudy, it can go different directions. We've Carl this year, it's been up and down at different times too. And the commitment to the identity and the lineup pairings, kind of regardless of how effective those guys have been, I think it's getting us almost 10, 10 games into the season being like, oh yeah, we know this is what we're doing. We're not going to pitch the Nas thing here. Like he's going to play no matter what. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that was not, again, that was not baked uh, into, into the DNA of this, this team a a, a season ago. And that bigness leads to the defensive identity, which is leading them to be the number one half court defense, the team that teams are shooting the worst against the number one overall defensive rating uh, in, in the league right now. I don't think they would have those things if they were switching back and forth from we're playing this way with Carl, we're playing this way with Rudy. It's the, yeah. the com- I think the success um, has been has been found in the in the commitment. Anything else you want to hit on before we wrap it? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was a good point. Just kind of what you said about Finch and his usage of Nas, and and mm-hmm. I, you know I don't know when the moment. Hit, maybe we'll ask finch this later on but yeah i don't don't know when the moment hit where like finch kind of went from being reticent to play nas in and out of the rotation um to okay (laughs) this this guy needs at least 20 minutes every (laughs) single night even when carl comes back i want i wonder when that moment hit for him when obviously it happened when carl was out last year but like at what moment did he realize like that okay and and for the front office as well like mm-hmm. you know, Tim Connolly being like, we need to make sure this guy, <laughs> this guy right. is here uh, for the next few years. Um, you know, because I, I think it, it it does mark a profound shift in how they viewed this team mm-hmm. moving forward and how it 
and how it has how it has all kind of come together because the way Finch talks about Nas now was not how he was talking about Nas a year ago, mm-hmm. um, especially a season ago, where it's like he, he said multiple times like Nas is one of our best players and we need to make sure he's playing. Yeah, he's playing minutes. Like Nas is not a Nas's minutes are non negotiable right now. Like yeah. Nas needs to be on the floor. He needs to have minutes. That that was not the case this time last year. That that is a notable difference. Yeah. That that was that was not the the, the case a, a season ago. Um, plug some things quick. Obviously, Chris has uh, mm-hmm. a couple pieces up on StarTribune.com uh, from from last night. Uh, some lengthier quotes about that whole Mike and Ant uh, decision uh, mm-hmm. offensively uh, in the fourth quarter. There, in, in addition to just a, a gamer on the the overall. Uh, win for the Wolves over the Warriors. I want to make sure to uh, be plugged into that. Obviously, these episodes are uh, available on on YouTube as well. If that's something uh, you want to be you want to be checking out, and if you you know if you're not just in the car or something like that and want to watch um, on YouTube, you can do that. We play the audio clips you're hearing are videos. Uh, sometimes I think that can be valuable in seeing some of the facial expressions, like actually, right. Like seeing Rudy this year, right. Chris, yeah, rather yeah. than just hearing him, it's a, it's a shift. Like yeah. in just his demeanor is, is, mm-hmm. is very, very uh, different this season. So uh, that's youtube.com slash uh, I think it's at Dane Moore NBA. And then uh, we do have little clips, uh, one or two kind of from most of these episodes coming out that are on Instagram uh, and TikTok, And for both of those, that's at Dane Moore NBA. Uh, underscore podcast. So maybe if you're not able to listen to every single episode, but you want to get the gist of a cool stat that Chris or Jace or whoever uh, rattle out or a a funny thing like that, that's on there too. We're trying to, we'd like to get some uh, more followers over there again too. So Instagram or TikTok at Dane Moore MBA underscore podcast. Follow Chris on Twitter at Christopher Hine. We'll be at practice tomorrow uh, and or shoot around tomorrow and the, the game on Tuesday. So Think you're already following Chris, but uh, everything he's doing there, and we will have another game here in San Francisco on on Tuesday night, and I will uh, get on Wednesday morning uh, with Jace Frederick to to break that one down. Uh, until then, he's Chris. I'm Dane. Peace out. How I'm feeling, man. I hope it never stop. Yeah, green and hot, so you can find me in the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Don't let standards ever ever bring you down. Yeah.